wonderful. Boy, I'll tell you what, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Boy, I just feel good today. And it's one of those days where it seems like Satan just throws everything in the world at you. And so I could, I turned around to, to Jason. I said, isn't that something? The way the tape did and they couldn't, you know, and I'm not blaming the guys. That's just Satan. And I got up this morning, and I'll tell you, I got such a blessing out of my message that uh, I, I was almost late. So I ran in and I took my shower and combed my hair and put my suit on and got almost to church, you know. In fact, I got in church. Somebody said, are you growing a beard? And I, I forgot to shave. So I went home and shaved, almost back to church. And I thought, oh, man, where's my glasses? So I had to turn around and go home and get my glasses. But it's just been one of those kind of days. And you know, there's one thing I've always noticed. Anytime you have one of those kind of days, look for a blessing. God is going to bless you. And he has really blessed me uh, by this sermon. And I wish I could tell it to you. <laughs> no, I'm going to do that. But I hope you get the same blessing that I got out of it when God gave it to me. It, it just really blessed me. And, and I know that that has to come from the Holy Spirit and and, and maybe the Holy Spirit will impress upon you the message like maybe he does me or someone else. But I really hope that he does, and I pray that he does. Uh, turn, if you will, to Matthew. The sixth chapter. The 33rd verse. I'll also be reading in Luke. Boy, that song was, boy, I knew that was wonderful. Man, it just, I'm just, I'm ready for the Lord to come back, aren't you? Those ladies do such a wonderful job. They, they, we just got, God has really blessed this church with talent. Uh, I mean, just about everybody in here can sing or play guitar or something. You know, it, God has really blessed us. And a lot of churches don't even have piano players. And God has just really blessed us. I don't know what to title this sermon. And I, the guys always want me to put a title on it because, so they know what to put on the tape. And I guess you could title it First Things First. Or Getting Your Priorities Straight. Getting Your Priorities Right. All of us have priorities in our life, but we don't always have them in the proper order. And notice what the Lord said. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But seek ye first. Now, we're going to find out what he said previous to this, but... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why is that? Well, because when Christ created, the Bible says that he created all of the animal kingdom from the dust of the ground. How many knew that? I've heard preachers just say, God just spoke and there was just millions of birds and so forth. No, the Bible says that they were formed by his hands from the dust of the ground, but when he created man, he did something different. The Bible says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. In other words, man became eternal. So seek ye first the kingdom of God. Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, we don't have an eternal kingdom here. The eternal soul needs an eternal city. And we don't have one here. Peter said, I saw the earth pass away as a, a, a rock to and fro as a drunken man and pass away with a loud noise and a fervent heat. You see, a lot of people have their priorities wrong. They spend their whole life laying up treasures, properties, wealth for here and it's all going to pass away. First, take care of your soul. Be sure that your soul is saved so that you will have an eternal 
kingdom. It says in Hebrews, we receive a kingdom that does not pass away. So seek ye first that kingdom. And guess what? He said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, a lot of people think that God saves grudgingly. It's kind of like he will because he said he will and he has to, but he doesn't really want to. And it's kind of like I'll save you, but I'm really going to watch you. You better watch the line. He says it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the reason he says seek that first. Get that first. Get your priorities straight. Do we have our priorities straight? Wouldn't it be something? Now you stop and think about it. Wouldn't it be something if we Christians had our priorities straight? Now stop and think about it. We want to take care of all of our fleshly needs before we even think about our spiritual needs. Now, my wife owns an herbal company, and Ted Lynch is the office manager. He manages it for her. And it's an herbal weight loss center. Now, people call, and the first thing he asks them, of course, is their name and address and phone number. But then he says, how much would you like to lose? And he says, have you tried any other weight loss programs? And you know, just about everybody has that calls. Oh, yes, I've tried Weight Watchers, Nutrisystem, Jenny Craig. What's some of the others? That, but they've tried them all. Wouldn't it be something if we Christians had our priorities straight and we were concerned about feeding the soul, the part that is eternal? Wouldn't it be something, Wayne, if we spend as much time feeding the soul as we do the body? Wouldn't it be amazing if we had to have spiritual weight loss centers because we were too fat spiritually? Wouldn't it be something? Somebody calls and says, yes, I just wonder if you could help me. Now, I've tried it on my own. Well, why do you want to lose weight? Well, because I don't fit in with the world. People laugh at me. I don't have a good self-image. I'm just too spiritual. I'm just too fat. Well, maybe we can help you. Have you tried any other weight loss programs? No, but I've tried it on, on my own. And you know what? I've tried cutting back on praying. <laughs> and I've tried cutting back on Bible study. And I do pretty good for a little bit, and I start losing some spiritual weight. And then first thing you know, I'm praying more than I ever did. And I wind up fatter than I was before. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something if we had our priorities straight? And we start taking care of eternal things and feeding our soul and growing in the Lord? Wouldn't it be something to say, well, what are you feeding on? Oh, well, I just really love the book of John. Oh, 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 that's too fat me. No, get over there in numbers. Now, you can eat all of the genealogies you want to. They're low fat. All the begats, that's not going to hurt you any. See, you can read all that stuff, but don't get in John. Don't study the great doctrines of the Bible because that's just too fat. Then you'll put on too much spiritual weight. Wouldn't that be something we had to do that because Christians were too fat spiritually? Man, that'd be something, wouldn't it? Well, how much do you pray? Oh, I pray a lot. You're going to have to cut that out. We're cutting you down to one now. Lay me down to sleep. That's all you get. How much spiritual water? What about the water of life? How much? Yeah, I drink a lot of that. Okay, we're going to have to cut you down on that too. You're just getting too fat spiritually. You don't fit in with the world. You know, most of us don't have that problem, though, Brother Wayne. We fit in with the world pretty good. You know, we're not persecuted because we're too fat spiritually, are we? Well, what about going to church? Do you go to church? Yes, I go Sunday school, Sunday morning. I go Sunday night, and then I go on Wednesday night. Oh, you're going to have to cut that out. We're cutting you down to either Sunday school or morning worship. No Sunday night, no Wednesday night. Well, we're going to get that fat off of you. How about giving to the Lord's work? Oh, I love to give. I give hilariously. I'm a cheerful giver. Oh, we're going to have to cut that out. You're going to have to start giving grudgingly. <laughs> and not very much. 
Yeah, well, most of us don't have any trouble in that department anyway, see, but, you know, you're going to have to start giving grudgingly. In fact, when they get ready to pass the plate, why don't you just kind of duck out and go to the restroom? That'll work. Boy, you'll really lose spiritual weight doing that. Hey, isn't it amazing, though? It, it, it's really amazing. I mean, we'll take the family out to eat, and we don't think nothing spending five or six dollars to feed the family, you know? <laughs> but it makes us mad if they pass the collection plate. People say, oh, they want your money. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now that will ruin you forever eating in restaurants. Get ready for this. This is sickening. All they want is your money. Don't let the guest check fool you. You're not a guest. They're going to make you pay. <laughs> and you know, you go in, you eat your meal, and the little girl comes back and says, would you like some pie? What kind you got? Oh, we got coconut. Well, yeah, thank you. Hey, what you doing? She's writing that on the ticket. You're not a guest. If you think you are, you walk on by the cash register. <laughs> See what happens. Churches don't want your money. We pass the collection plate. But folks, God is my witness. If you don't want to put a dime in there, don't do it. And you're just as welcome as you can be. Did you know if all we wanted your, was your money, you know what we'd do? Let me tell you how we'd do it. You'd come in and sit down, and we'd have waitresses come up to you and say, Can I help you? Yes, I'll have two songs, a sermonette, and I believe I'll have a funny story for dessert. Okay. And we'd have a cash register down there at the door. That don't stop people from going to the restaurants and the ball games and the grocery stores and all they want is your money. But I'm not going to church because all they want is my money. Isn't that silly? That's silly. We're spiritually starved to death because we don't have our priorities straight. We put more value on the here and now and the flesh than we do our spiritual prosperity. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's tragic. I remember reading a sermon that Charles Spurgeon had preached one time, and he was telling about two pictures that he'd seen. And both of them were ships that were reaching the shores of the glory land. And he said, one of the ships, the sail was full of wind, and the people were there dressed in wonderful gay colors, and they were laughing and singing and rosy cheeks and all. They were just having a grand time. And the other ship, the sails were ripped, the people's clothes were in in rags and they were just starved and they were hanging over the side of the ship and they were just kind of washed ashore. And he said that depicts two types of Christians. The first ship are the Christians that have learned to live the abundant life. The other ship is the, are the Christians that are spiritually starved and they just make heaven by the skin of their teeth, nearly dead. Guess which boat God wants you in? The first one. You know, when I was studying this and the Holy Spirit was just blessing me, and I feel good today. I feel so good today. It really taught me something. Listen, Christians should be known by their song, not their sigh. We should be happy. I'm not saying silly, but we should be full of joy. We ought to have our priorities stay straight. We should be spending most of our time on our knees with God in prayer, getting our spiritual batteries recharged, feeding on the Word of God so that we can live the abundant life, so that we can be the kind of witness that we need to be. Do you know what? There's an old saying, if you smile, people will wonder what you're up to. 
And did you know that if you're full of joy, I mean real joy, and only Christ gives joy. See, happiness is dependent upon happenings, all right? As long as I get my coconut pie, I'm happy, see? As long as she lays my socks out for me and they're the right color, I'm happy. As long as everything goes right, I'm happy. But joy is not contingent upon happenings. Paul and Silas was in prison. They'd been beaten, but they were singing praises to God. And that's something that the world can't counterfeit. And if Christians were in the Word of God, in prayer with the Heavenly Father, and were fat spiritually, the world would want what we've got. Now, I tease Wayne all the time because, Wayne, how you doing today? Just terrible, you know. But you know what? Now, he says that as a joke, but, but, you know, I think it's bad when we go to our friends and relatives and people we work with that aren't Christians. And we're always moaning and going because we're broke and we don't feel good. And, uh, you know, well, they say, well, what do you got I want? You see what I mean? But if we were filled with joy, filled with the Spirit, because we're in God's Word and communicating with the Father, it sure make witnessing a lot easier, wouldn't it? We would be, they would be drawn to us like magnets. The Lord says, get your priorities straight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Start feeding the spiritual man. Did you know what? Now, people love their soul. Even the sinner loves his soul. Do you believe that? Yes, they do. If you will look in Luke, I'm sorry. I'm sorry again, it is Luke, okay? Uh, it's the 12th chapter of Luke. Look at the 16th verse, and we'll find there's a rich man here, and he, he was concerned about his soul. In fact, his soul came first with him, but he had his priorities wrong. And a certain, in a, and he spake a certain parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, see, he was concerned about his soul. Everything he was doing was for his soul, but his priorities was wrong. He didn't, he was, didn't first make sure that his soul was secure. But all that he was laying up was for his soul. But it was all temporary. It was just temporary, temporal things. And he said, I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You don't have your priorities straight. That's really what God's saying. Look what he says. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He didn't have his priorities straight. He loved his soul. Everything he did was for his soul, but he didn't take time to secure his soul. Did you know that if you eat junk food, it'll make you fat? How many know that? Do you, do you realize that $33 billion a year is spent on weight loss? And the reason Americans are overweight is because we eat junk food. That's the reason I go to Hardy's. I mean, it's nutritious. They cook their french fries in pure hog lard. Can't get better than that. But we eat a lot of junk food. And junk food will make you fat. 
But if you feed the spiritual man junk food, it makes him thin. And do you know I'm afraid that we're feeding our spiritual man junk food? And not enough of that even. Not enough nourishment. We don't get in the Bible. We don't have our quiet time. We don't spend time with God in prayer. Then we wonder why we're always defeated, always worried, always sick, always wringing our hands, always griping. We're starved to death spiritually. Now look at what Jesus says here in this. He says, first of all, don't be concerned about temporary things. He said, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, which is one penny? Are not, now uh, if you're wondering where I am, that's the sixth verse of chapter 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Now think about it. God is concerned about one little sparrow. And he says, are ye not worth more than many sparrows? Now stop and think about it. If God sent his only begotten son to die for you on the cross, if the, the highest, highest price that heaven could pay was for you, are ye not worth more than little birds that God watches and provides for? And he said, what if you do worry about it? There's not a thing you can do about it. Look what he says. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do you think God doesn't know about you? Okay, if God knows how many hairs I have, do you think he knows about my other concerns? Do you, have any, do you think maybe he knows about my needs? If he knows how many hairs that I have on my head. Now, it doesn't take him near as long to count some of his hair as it does others. But maybe it gives him more time to take care of your needs so you don't have to spend so much time counting how much hair you got. But does it just make sense if God knows how many hairs you have on your head that he knows all about you, all of your needs, everything that concerns you? Of course he does. He knows how much hair you have on your head. And he says, what if... What if you are in need? What can you do about it? Look at verse 26. If ye then be, then be not able... Well, let's look at verse 25. And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? You say, I'm too short. Well, what are you going to do about it? There's not a thing you can do about it. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least... Why take ye thought for the rest? He said, what are you worried about? Now, first of all, here's what he's not saying. He's not saying, if you don't worry, I'll take care of you. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, don't worry, because I'm going to take care of you. So, if he's going to take care of me, what am I worried about? Why should I go around wringing my hands if he has already promised? I know, Jerry, I know all about you. I know how many hairs you have on, the, on your head. I love you enough that I sent my only begotten son to die on a rugged cross for you. I'm going to take care of you. I said this, I believe it was Wednesday night. I believe the greatest insult and probably one of the greatest forms of hypocrisy is to say we're trusting Jesus and then we go around worrying all the time. That's not trusting Jesus. <clears throat> trusting Jesus means that I put my future, I put my soul, I, I put my all in his hands. 
to take care of it. Anything you commit to the Lord, he'll take care of. Did you know that? Paul says, for I have committed into him. He says, for I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. What did you commit unto it? Did you commit your soul into him? He says, well, I'm, 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 I'm persuaded he's able to keep it. What about your house payment? Well, commit it to him. If you're worried about it, just commit it to him. He'll keep it. What about your job? Commit it to him. He says, I love you more than the little birds. And he said, I put feathers on them. He said, I put the petals on the flowers. And he said, even Solomon isn't arrayed as one of these little flowers. You know what? I, I was just sitting there this morning. I happened to look out the back window. And there was a squirrel. He was running down a high line. And guess what he was wearing? A fur coat. <laughs> it's pretty too. He didn't have to take it to cleaners. He didn't have to get up and brush it. And when the hair falls out, he grows new ones. Guess who gave him that? God. Yeah, but I don't have a fur coat. I don't know what I'm going to wear tomorrow. I don't know. You think God loves you more than the squirrels? Maybe not the whales, but the squirrels. <laughs> isn't that silly? I mean, isn't that silly? People get so concerned about saving the whales or whatever, and I think we ought to save them, you know. I can't get one in my goldfish bowl, but I think we ought to save the whales. I don't think we ought to destroy God's creation or that they become extinct. But guess what, folks? That's all going to pass away anyway. It's all temporary. Don't you think we ought to be more concerned about what's eternal? I do. Do you? Are you even concerned about your soul's salvation? Are you more concerned about what you're going to have for dinner than whether one of your children is going to go to hell or not? Are you more concerned with the TV guide than the Bible? <laughs> a lot of people are. We need to be feeding the spiritual man so that we can have the abundant life, so that we can have joy. That's what people are really looking for, is that strength in the time of trials. And that only comes from God. You know what? When everything's going great like it is this morning, I feel great this morning. I got this morning, I just feel good. The weather's beautiful. They didn't turn off the electric. You know, they give me another week. No, I'm just joking about it. I feel great. Well, when everything's going real good, you don't need a great big God. And I think that's the whole problem with people in America. We have it too easy. But in countries where they're under severe persecution, they have to trust God. And that makes them closer to God. And they know what it means to walk with God. But in America, we are so blessed. In the rest of the world, they're praying, God, give us this day our daily bread. In America, we're praying, God, help me stay on my diet. And that's something we are so blessed. Boy, we need to take a look right down here and say, I'm going to start feeding the spiritual man. Then when you get so spiritual that we can't stand you anymore, we'll find a spiritual weight loss center for you. But I don't look for that day to ever come. Wouldn't it be something if this whole church was filled with spiritual heavyweights? It can be. God wants it. Did you know that? God wants it. He said, I come to give you life and that more abundantly. And guess what he said? He didn't say, I want you to earn it. He said, I come to give it to you. Give it to you. I'll give you the abundant life. All you have to do is take it. And how do you take it? With prayer. Study his word. Spend quiet time with him. Crowd the world out. 
Spend time with God. Feed the inner man. Feed the soul. I think most of us kind of like the old cowboy. <laughs> the old cowboy went to a revival one time, an old, you know, country revival, and the preacher got up there and said, preached the sermon and said, everybody wants to go to heaven. And the old cowboy stood up and said, how many of you here really want to go to heaven? Everybody held their hand up, and he just pulled out his forty-five and said, okay, stand up, and I'll punch your ticket. Well, nobody stood up. And you know, I think so many times we're saying, oh, I'll be glad the Lord comes back, but I hope he don't come today. Why? We're not spiritually fat. You see, the more time you spend with God, the more you want to be in his presence. The more you want to, you're, you're longing for the return of the Lord. And guess who he's coming for? Those who are looking for and longing for his return. Let's stand.